These are all of the nodes that you're going to need to do looped noise or other procedural textures in Blender. This setup will give you one full tile per UV space, or if you're using something like object coordinates or the geometry position output, which is world space, then multiplying this by 6.283 or tau or 2 pi, that is gonna give you that full wavelength every one meter. But why does this work? What is this actually doing and what can we use it for? A few examples of when you'd wanna use this would be if you have a single tile that you want to export to a game and create something which loops. For example, something like this, where if I remove this smoothing, then you can see that we get a bit of a desert, some sand dunes, right? And from down here on the surface, it really doesn't bother you that these are looped, but we can see that we can really optimize our game by just having a single tile here. And all we're exporting at this point is going to be a height map. Another reason you'd want to loop noise is so that you can get displacement, animated displacement, uh, moving across something in a way which is gonna loop. So it's perfect for looped animations as well. So going back to our nodes, why does this work? Well, let's jump into it. We're gonna be starting out here in geometry nodes just to give this a little bit of a clearer explanation. Some of this stuff is gonna be much easier for us to visualize here, but you know we can use it in geometry nodes or we can be using this in shaders. Something that we need to understand is how to create a circle. Essentially, we want our noise to start and end in the same place to give us a loop. And so what better way to do it than to create circles? Go ahead and just add in a curve primitive curve line. We are going to be adding a resample curve and then a set position node. So far, so good we can plug into our position a combine XYZ and we will plug into our X a spline parameter factor, just like this. I'm gonna go control H just to hide those other two sockets we don't need. So the spline parameter factor gives us a zero to one along the length of the spline. The reason I'm doing this is because our UV map is also a length of zero to one across its width. This also is just gonna help us visualize what's going on. So a little bit of graphing for us here. Uh, I might actually just skin this to make it easier to see as well. So let's use a curve to mesh with a curve circle, just so we can see it nice and clearly. There we go. Gonna make a few more points on here. Let's go up to 32. And first of all, let's try plugging our spline parameter into both X and Y. So as we go from zero to one in X, we go from zero to one in Y. Now, what happens if we add a sine function to this? So utility math node, let's just drop this onto that noodle going into the X axis. And instead of add, let's set this to sine. We're gonna need a little bit more space. So a sine wave or a cosine wave they have a wavelength of two pi. So we can just add another math node, set to multiply, drop it on here and multiply by, you can either write two times pi or TAU or Ryan. So we've got ourselves a sine graph and you might be familiar with these from school. Sine graphs represent simple harmonic motion. It goes up to a value of one and it goes back down to a value of minus one. But to change this over to a cosine graph, well, now we're starting at one and coming down and then going back up, but it's the same graph, it's just offset slightly. And this is actually quite important because at this point, what happens if we plug a sine and a cosine in at the same time is we get a full circle. So why is this happening? Well, when the spline parameter is zero, cosine in the Y gives us one. And then the sine in the X will give us zero. And then as we track around here, because we have simple harmonic motion and it is out of sync with itself, we can actually track around a perfect circle. So this is really the fundamentals of how we're doing our looped noise, our looped mapping coordinates, is we're creating a circle in the X and Y plane, where we have a single gradient with a wavelength of two pi, 
going through sine and cosine into two separate axes. But it was a little bit more complicated than that when we did the noise texture. So let's jump back into our shader and have a look at what's different. So to preview this, I'm going to be using a Voronoi because it gives us nice sharp edges. So have a look at this, here we go. And we're going to be plugging into the vector. This is just like our set position. So plug into the vector, a combine X, Y, Z. Into the X, we will plug in a sine and into the Y, we will plug in a cosine. So just exactly the same as we did before with geometry nodes. Now coming into this, we need our gradient. So for this, we're going to be using the UV map or you could use any other mapping coordinates. This is going to go through a separate X, Y, Z. And we'll just take the one gradient because this is our uh, single gradient here. So just the same as we had before, right? Zero to one, going through sine, going through cosine and being combined. So just after our UV map, we're going to be adding a converter vector math and we will set this to be scale just so that we're scaling in both axes at the same time. Now you might want to do this differently. You might want to use a multiply node depends on how big your tile is and which coordinates you're using. So TAU into your scale. All right, so what we have this time is, I mean, it's essentially the same, right? If I turn on displacement on this material, add some subdivisions, set this to adaptive. And then if I just plug this into a displacement node, um, let's add one. And then let's plug in, for example, our sine wave going to rendered. Well, this is exactly what our geometry notes was giving us before, right? We have a continuous gradient in one axis, sort of a linear gradient, and then we're doing a sine wave. And equally, the cosine there is going to give us the same result. We're just displacing this graph now. The problem is, it's being displaced in the height, and we're wanting to view this from above. And because everything is coming off a single axis here, the X axis, everything is simply traveling in the one direction. And that means as soon as this goes through a Voronoi texture, well, this isn't very interesting anymore. But sure, it does join and end at the same place because we have it starting going around, up and back, right? So we need to add a second axis that's gonna collapse these two nodes here. So to add a second axis, we are gonna be coming off the Y axis now. So now both our sine and our cosine come off in this direction. What's actually happening here? Well, if we plug the X and the Y into a separate sine and cosine, we're still thinking about making a circle, right? We're using sine and we're using cosine. One is going in the up and down axis. One is going in the horizontal axis. Why does this not loop perfectly as well? Well, sine and cosine make up for each other's slowest points. Uh, if we draw out these grids here, where sine is steepest at this point here, cosine is least steep, it's at its flattest point, right at the bottom of the curve. And when sine is at its levelest, essentially the, the slowest that it's moving across our texture here, that is where cosine is at its fastest. So these two make up for each other. That's why when we use them for a circle, it gives a perfect circle plot because you can get a nice continuous motion around the circle. In the case of our texture though, this isn't quite right. So we need cosine to make up for sine in the x-axis, but then we need more axes, right? So now we can use the y-axis with sine and cosine. We will make up the Z here, which has given us almost the right pattern, but we still have this one slow section in the middle where our texture is being stretched quite a lot. So we need an additional axis here. So we'll plug this final cosine into our W of the 4D noise. And now the cosine is making up for the slow points in sine. So this has given us perfectly tiling noise and importantly with a wavelength of two pi. And that means that every time you have a distance of two pi in your gradient, you have a full wavelength here. Important to note, there are some limitations of this process. We have Voronoi texture here. We are using a 4D Voronoi. However, if, for example, I was to put this onto 
a monkey. And rather than using the UV map, let's go ahead and use a 3D coordinate space like object. Well, now we're going to be getting stretching in the Z axis. If I go from above, it looks perfect. If I go from the front, we get stretching. Why is this happening? It's because our original coordinates are only using the X and Y axis. So even though our final texture is four dimensional, in order to make full use of our sines and cosines, the texture is actually being mapped in the XY space only. If you want to have a fully three dimensional repeating pattern, you can do this again, sine and cosine off the Z, but you're going to need to make your own 6D texture. That might seem a little bit weird, like we only exist in three dimensions. How are we dealing with four dimensions? Noise texture, boring noise texture, they're all just mathematical formulas, right? Any additional dimensions that you add to them, they're actually just a, like, it's a variable. Blender and the maths doesn't care if you're using space or if you're just using a value. That's all it's going to be read as, and it's going to go through the formula and treat it as a number. So you can derive your own six dimensional formulas for doing 3D tiling plots. Let's burn through a really quick setup here where we can do a looped animation in geometry nodes just to get something moving and repeating. I'm back in geometry nodes here. I've just got a plane object as my container. Let's add a new geometry nodes, call this one a looped animation. We're going to need something which is going to move. So let's go ahead and use a point. This is all we actually need at this point. We're going to be controlling the position of the point so that it moves erratically through space, but it returns to its original position. We can then process this instance things on it however we want to afterwards, and we should get a looped animation. So let's take our point. We are going to derive the position or offset the position by taking the position and adding a vector math add. we will be adding noise texture, but noise is between zero and one. So we are first of all going to be subtracting 0.5 from it. So we take noise color into a subtract node, subtract 0 0.5. We might want to scale this as well, just to give it a bit of a bigger effect. And then we need to be driving our noise texture with our newfound looping ability. Let's take 4D on here. We're going to be combining X, Y, Z for our vector, and we will just be using a sine for the X, cosine for the Y, and then another sine and cosine for the Z and the W. We can drive these off a separate X, Y, Z, X, and Y for the second two. And then these, we can take off a position node. Here we go. Let's take our detail down to zero, scale down to 0.5 or something like that. So if we want our point to move around, driven by our noise texture, then we're going to need to add something to the original input position. Now, if we think about this, we have our noise doing something like this, right? So it's coming through the sine, the cosine. So this is our mapping coordinates. I need, for one loop, essentially, to move the current position over here by 2 pi. That's all you got to do. If you want one loop, you just have to move it 2 pi in some direction, and you will result in whatever it is that you're doing being looped through that motion. This is a little bit different to shaders, where you'll want to be adding after the sine and cosine. In all likelihood, that's not going to give you a loop. In fact, it won't give you a loop. It'll just give you a new seed. So if you're wanting to do the looped offset, that needs to happen before your separate x, y, z. Go ahead and add a vector math node. We're going to be using a combine x, y, z. I'm going to be using a map range into my x here, and I'm going to find out what my frame range is. So we are going to be looping from 1 to 100. Our scene time frame output here from 1 to 100 is going to be from 0 to 2 pi or TAU tau. And actually, here's a little bit of a kind of confusing one. 0 and 2 pi, in terms of a circle, exactly the same. 0 and 360 degrees, right? So to make sure that we don't get a double frame between 1 and 100, 
what we can do is make sure that we're actually starting here at zero. So now zero and 100 will be the same, but we are animating from one to 100. So we will just get that continuous cyclic loop. So if I now play this, should not see any stepping. There we go, we've just gone back to the beginning. We're getting this kind of continuous movement. Amazing, so let's go ahead and add a different seed value as well. So I'm going to just add a math node afterwards after my cosine. So I can just wait until I found some noise that I like. Go for a slightly higher scale on my noise if I want this to be faster. Yeah, if I wanted to go further in, well, yeah, go through a, a more interesting noise in that distance. And we can make this travel further with this final scale here. So this little setup here, this is going to give us a looped displacement of geometry over 100 frames. So from 1 to 100 frames with a seed value that we can set over here. Let's in fact plug this in with a value node just to make sure that we've marked it as a seed. So this is essentially your new W input is just by adding to that W. And we're going to get a perfect loop here. So this provides a lot of opportunity for creating looped simulations, looped animations, interesting looped textures, things like that. So anywhere that you have access to a four dimensional noise or Voronoi or Musgrave or anything like that, you can create a perfectly looped animation or whatever it is that you need to do. These are the nodes. This has been a little bit of maths for you. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. I'll catch you in the next one.